Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to just start our meeting because I know we're, time is of the essence here, and I thank you all for being here once again. I'm wearing my cow hat. We're going to be in Stanford this Saturday, you know. Okay, have a good game. Uh, go Bears, yeah. Okay, so we're going to just go around, uh, start with welcomes and introductions, and we'll start with uh, Catherine. Hi, Catherine Holmes, Coalition America, say, um, sign sheet going around. Please sign in, even if you're of your audience, because if you don't sign in, the record will not reflect our memories on how <coughs> Hi, Lori Medina with the Department of Social Services here for the Internet Medicine. Good afternoon. I'll start the Medicine for Health Department of Monterey County. Elliot Robinson, the member. Uh, Jim Meyer, Service Center, Medical County. Matt Huerta, Housing Program Manager with the uh, Monterey uh, Bay Economic Partnership. Kurt Shockey with the Veterans Transition Center. Dave Pacheco with the CSA. Robin McCray, Community Human Services. Dana Clary, she's done. Layout School, Mayor City is in office. Mayor Gonzalez, Hopkins, Hurts. Welcome to your Mayor City. Director Barbara, Supervisor Luis Alejo, and then we'll go here. Hey, Anastasia Wyatt, City of Miami. Councilman Gerardo, Sanchez, Luis. Welcome to the Department of Social Services. Rafael Hernandez, Canada. Ashley Gower, with Canada, Monterey, and Partnership. Want to go here? Jan Mason with iHealth. Kathy Will with the public and the Sunset Hall School. Craig Potts, public. Rob Rapp, Community Human Services. Melissa Ruiz, City of Salinas. Katie Little, City of Salinas. Costa Vasquez, San Diego. Eric Johnson, Jay Hall Associates. Bill Harris, Salinas, Creek Bridge, Neighborhood. Creek Bridge, <coughs> Miami. Uh, uh, West Wise, City Resident. Joe McCall, Salinas resident. Lauren Salonsuka, Department of Social Services. Alexa Johnson, Housing Resource Center. Jessica Jarrett, Housing Resource Center. Katrina McKenzie with the Homeless Coalition. All right, that's a good group. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're going to just go to whether we have any additions or updates to the agenda, Captain? No, sir. Okay. Uh, now is the time for public comment. Uh, we've got a couple minutes. For, uh, if, if people want to comment on anything not on today's agenda or on the agenda, is it time to do so? Yes. Um, so again, my name is Craig Pox. I'm a resident of Creek Ridge neighborhood in Salinas, which is where the city of Salinas has determined to put shelters um, at our doorstep. Um, I've said this at all these public meetings, but we have volunteered with homeless services. We donated goods. We went to the Chinatown block party. We're not against homeless people. I think that it's important that when you are making your decision about where this money is going, to consider all of the stakeholders, and that includes the people that are in the, the neighborhoods, the parks, um, that are buying these shelters that the city of Salinas has said they're getting almost all of this money to build these shelters. Um, so I just wanted to say that, that there are other stakeholders that need to be considered as well. Thank you for your comments, sir. Anyone else? Okay, over here. Here, Bill Harris. Yes, Bill. I'm a resident of Creek Bridge for 20 years, and what they're doing, have planned this uh, surprise on us on 1 October at the golf course in Creek Ridge is a shamble, is a shame. Lack of communication, they're lying to us, they're, we can't get support from the city, we can't even get the flyers they gave to us on 1 October. We're resisting this, we've had problems that the city of Salinas and the Monterey County has not been able to get on top or stay on top in our neighborhood right next to where these two locations are going. Again, we're not against the uh, heat plan, the, emergency, uh, the homeless emergency aid program. We're against location, location, location. And we're going to resist. Thank you. Thank you. Go. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, my name is Wes, uh, President of Salinas Homeless Union as well. Uh, I think it'd be great if we could do a um, uh, census building uh, database baseline of uh, where people are at as far as uh, looking for services. You know, people outside, uh, are they looking for services? What, what services have they already signed up for? What kind of responses have they gotten? Where are they at in the waiting list? How long have they been there? Uh, you know, and how long have they, 
Yeah. How many times have they, they've been pushed out of where they're at? Uh, can we treat these people better? Can we work with them better? Can we set some minimal rules, boundaries, guidelines of, uh, you know, your, your place is organized, there's not trash everywhere, and you're not doing drugs in front of us, and we don't see any solar property, so therefore you're just poor. Can we help, how can we help the city and county entities legitimize these campsites where 95% of people are already outdoors? Uh, we just need to validate where they're at and, and try to scaffold them so that they can be progressed and reintegrated into society. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to close uh, our public comments. Um, anyone else? Uh, folks that came in that haven't introduced themselves yet? I'm Cheryl County, homeless ladies on for Selena City Elementary School. Okay, the gentleman that just came in right next to you, Dan Baldwin, Community Foundation from our. Uh, Anyone else who came in? Okay. Uh, then we're going to our, um, let's see, just our consent agenda is just our meeting minutes from October 24th. And I just need to enter, um, entertain a motion. Uh, so moved. moved by Mayor Gunter. Second. Second by uh, Mayor Orozco. And uh, <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, motion carries. Uh, any notes? Motion carries unanimously. Let's go to our um, January 2019 homeless census update. Why don't you read? So, the, as you know, we reported last month, you know, the homeless census is scheduled for January 31st. It, it is required to be conducted in the last 10 days of January around the entire country. It is critical, a critical uh, activity to put a die on these numbers for two years at a time. Um, we have formalized our adult survey, um, so that is finalized, and we're getting, we're setting up now uh, the volunteer recruitment piece. In order to pull off a good homeless census, we need like 200 volunteers throughout the community. Um, and so uh, pay attention because information will be coming your way. If you are a provider like that has outreach teams, you are really critical if you can give up your staff or some of your staff that day. If you know homeless guys who know where people sleep at night, you are critical in this, in this process. And if you're a homeless guy, remember that's a paid position, I believe, $15 an hour. So that information will be coming your way. Uh, also, uh, it will be posting on our website. Um, so. It's coming, and, and uh, we're talking about rolling back the time from 5.30 to 6 to 4.30 to 5, and that's a big AM. Except for you, you can do. Okay, so that's, you need 300 people. I need about 200, 200. 250 total, wow. um, and, and that's between both counties. Okay, and that day's January 31st. 31st. 31st, okay. All right, I'm sure we'll hear about that again. Okay, we have quite a few items to cover under the, the Homeless Emergency Assistance Program. We're going to start on top of that item, uh, Community Engagement Priority Review. And we've had uh, a lot of meetings over the last, well, during the month of November, so thank you for holding those in the afternoon and focusing about and putting those together. So there have, there have been a lot of meetings, a lot of community engagement, and um, I want to pass around, as you know, at least for the membership, this is just a snapshot, a snippet of what you're going to see, in case you want to reference back and forth to it. Okay? So, um, let's, before we start, I wanted to give you an update of the list of projected shelter crisis declarations. Right? So, so far in the end, we have the city of Marina, Monterey, Salinas, Hollister, Monterey County, Seaside, San Juan Batista, San Benito County. Um, Sand City and King City also. All right. I got those two this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, so note that the reports um, from this community engagement are included in your packet, the full reports, uh, which were sent out last week, I believe. They are also posted on our website. So if you go to our website and you look at the, go to our website and the COC funding, It'll say heat, and if you click on it, all, all the reports are there. Uh, so what I've done is um, kind of collate, collate the information that individually approved using the top threes and, the, and then collectively. So 
On 10, 16, 18, we're calling it a professional group. That was a meeting that was conducted with uh, service providers, law enforcement, uh, medical was there, um, you know, people who work with uh, people who experience homelessness. Um, and again, the full report is in your packet. The top three recommended, recommended priorities that came out of that meeting were, one, <coughs> is the creation of a community navigation team, and what does that mean? Um, that means helping people navigate the housing landscape to try to link them with precious units out there. Working with landlords to get them to accept subsidization, things of that, of that nature. And that fall fell under the broad category of enhanced client services and housing navigation and learning education programs, charge of case management. The second was a year-round shelter on the Monterey Peninsula, which fell under the expand bed and the Tory through new emergency shelter beds. And the third was a year-round shelter slash transitional housing at East Salinas, and they actually pinpointed the outer state to the side of the world. That also fell under the expand bed inventory through new emergency shelter beds. So those are the top three priorities, and again, there's a lot more detail in your packet. On 11 5, there was a community engagement meeting held in the city of Salinas. And please note that, you know, just because the meeting may have been held in the city of Salinas does not mean it was only Salinas residents. You know, people have the option of going to whatever meeting they want to do. The top three priorities that, that uh, flowed out of that meeting were targeted street outreach, health and safety programs, criminal justice diversion programs, expanding homeless bed inventory for new emergency shelter beds and enhanced client services and housing navigation, members education, and criminal justice diversion programs. <clears throat> on 11 8, a community meeting was held on the, the Monterey Peninsula. The top three re recommended priorities are enhanced client services through housing navigation, landlord education, and targeted case management. The second priority were programs for unaccompanied youth ages 18 to 24. The third priority was to expand the homeless bed inventory through new emergency shelter beds. On 11-9, there was a community meeting held in South Monterey County. The top three recommended priorities were enhanced client services through housing navigation, landlord mitigation, and targeted case management, rental assistance and rapid free housing programs, and there was a tie for enhanced client services through housing navigation, landlord mitigation, and targeted case management, and programs for unaccompanied youth ages 18 to 24. And note, the North Monterey County Community Meeting is scheduled for this Friday. There is no other day available. I'm sorry. Um, those are the official, uh, there's more, but those are the official <coughs> flowing out of this group to the community, uh, community engagement meetings. And top, so if you, put that, if you blend them together, the collective top three recommendations aggregated from the Salinas, Monterey Peninsula, and South County meetings were one target is through outreach, health and safety programs, criminal justice diversion programs. Second was expanding current, expanding current homeless bed inventory through new emergency shelter beds. And third was enhanced client services through housing navigation, landlord mitigation programs, and targeted case management. There were several uh, there were several focus groups that were conducted with people who were experiencing homelessness. Thank you to everybody who helped bring those together. The top three recommendations for the homeless population were enhanced client services and housing navigation, landlord mitigation programs, and targeted case management. The second was financial assistance programs such as movement costs, rental assistance programs. The third were employment services. On 11-15, an additional community meeting was held with the senior population. The top three recommended priorities from that group was to expand current bed inventory through transitional or other sorts of housing. The second priority was enhanced client services through housing navigation, landlord dedication programs, targeted case management, and there was a recommendation, the third recommendation was to allocate five to twenty percent of all funding for older adults. Say Catherine, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, so with the senior population, are these seniors in general or are these seniors who are homeless or uh, have, have experienced homelessness? I believe it was a mix. Okay. I had a question, just to clarify, 
seniors, 55, 62, 65? I think 62 and older. 62 and older. <coughs> on 11 7, there was an additional community meeting held on the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, they didn't quite follow the, the format. So the prioritized programs, the general approach, top three were one, to develop a plan that offers shelters of different sizes throughout the peninsula and focus on a neighborhood dispersion model. Two, the homeless people need which, which would fall under heat. Uh, two, homeless people need to be integrated into the community. Our neighborhoods can house a mixture of house and homeless individuals. True statement, not necessarily a program component. And three, at least one peninsula city should step up and open a permanent shelter. This is not my book. And that city should be monitored. Um, the Youth Action Board recommendations, um, the, these were not prioritized, as was done previously. Um, so we have given you five recommendations. One is a day shelter, a drop-in center with all amenities. The second was a, you know, this is all you face, a shelter with all amenities and services. So one's a day shelter, one's a night shelter, which could be combined. Three was family and maternity shelter with all amenities, services, and access to child care. Four, which would not be heat connected, training for community and service providers on the unique uh, needs of uh, unaccompanied youth. And five would be, which would actually be four, would be direct services to youth. So finding set of plans, which is also I passed around these the last day. In case you want to look at them side by side by side, <coughs> is that these are the top threes for all of the ones that we um, just went through. So if you take all of them, you aggregate them together, the top four collective comes out to be the expansion of current homeless bed inventory for a new emergency shelter bed. Enhancing client services through housing, navigation, landlord, mitigation program, targeted case management. Third, we target street outreach, health and safety programs, criminal justice diversion <coughs> programs, and four would be financial assistance programs, which would be moving costs, rental assistance, property housing, rental subsidies, things of that. So what now? So it's your choice. You know, do you want to prioritize? You're going to have to prioritize generally today, very generally today. Um, but when you start to look at your RFP process, that's when you can really get extremely specific. If you choose to be, that's completely up to you as a membership. And the ball is in your court and it's me. Line, line. <laughs> so that's the community gateway. I would just like to make sure that it's in the record to thank the Community Foundation and the Community Foundation who really helped and stepped up and paid for the consultants involved in a lot of these meetings so that our report and our findings um, are well presented and um, captured so <coughs> and really well. So does anybody have this this leads into our next discussion item? So does anybody have any questions about the engagement process? I want to say that our attendance is pretty good all, all the way around. Um, uh, and uh, it was, it was eye-opening for me at least to uh, hear the audience. But. And I want to take this opportunity before we open up the questions to thank Catherine and Ann for, for, for doing that. Because the community engagement process is critical because it's the foundation for what we do that. We went out and sought input from the different um, categories of folks that you were able to uh, get get their opinions and, and feedback on and I think that's going to be guidance for us and what we do but even if what we don't cover or fund through heat we hope that this simply that we offer the community will guide us uh, not only us as a body but hopefully the other local governments at the table to guide us on what, what could be possible in both counties in the future. Um, let's open up for questions. Uh, we have some hands being raised. Yes. Uh, is the 11 7 18 meeting just for the clarification? Is that the um, one that uh, Supervisor Adams? Yes. Okay. And then under the, your top four collective, and I don't mean to jump ahead, no, okay. but um, in terms of the next conversation, uh, expand current homeless bed inventory through new emergency shelters. There, uh, you know. Clearly, there's conversation about 
the proposed Salinas facility, but then also very specific about <coughs> something on the peninsula as well. Right. So I just think it ought to be, not necessarily written into that, I realize this is all for discussion purposes, but just, you know, there's subsets to that uh, that have to be considered uh, in our next discussion. Absolutely. Good point. Others? Uh, can we open for a board member for the public? Others? Yes. Um, I just made a point of clarification for myself. The top four don't appear to apply specifically to unaccompanied homeless youth. Is that being handled separately? Or am I to assume that that overlays the youth? Well, the minimum still applies for the youth. Correct. Uh, are those the top four collected for unaccompanied homeless youth? These were the top four from all of the meetings. So if the so so whatever rose to the top four is right there. Were people really thinking about youth when they made these lists? I mean, I saw one mention. I think of I think there's two somewhere yeah, in there. And I mean, it was represented at every meeting. So okay. Okay, um, Matt. I just make an observation. Um, first, amazing work, everybody, for doing all the community engagement. Um, I, in reading some of the material, noted that uh, you know while there's a lot of qualitative information, you know we got a lot of feedback. It's not quantitatively driven. It's not like you know everybody had one or two votes and it was scientific and everything else. So I just wanted to point that out in terms of an observation. It wasn't like a, a scientific survey was done of all the participants that, that attended, right? I mean, maybe you guys could see. Everyone had three votes. Because I thought I saw something here that, that, would, that there wasn't necessarily a process until after the second or third meeting. No, even from the beginning, everyone person. got three votes. What you're reading is a, the consultant is saying that um, uh, when we got, I think, to the third meeting is when we realized, oh, there are people who attended previous meetings. So we asked people who attended previous meetings not to vote again. So that she's going to, both of the consultants are going to say this is not scientifically driven process. It wasn't. It wasn't intended. Yeah, and so I just wanted to point that out that I think my sense in from hearing folks and talking to people over the last few weeks and months, and, um, it seems like this is representative of the discussions that, yeah. that we had. So I think that's, I just wanted to point that out in terms of anybody who's out there being a statistician or anything. Oh, yeah, 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 no, that's all. That's all. And, and also to hear anything that you had in addition to, to that. To do a scientific poll costs about $15,000. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, others? Just, um, quick, yes. Quick just that this sounds very much like what the best practices for the services are. But, uh, you're having events, having client services, and that the outreach and the rapid recovery program. So it's covering here. Yes, others? Any board members? Then we'll open up to public discussion. I had a couple of quick questions. Um, Catherine, I think you said at one of the meetings that uh, like a one-stop shop of include services and beds, that would be included under enhanced client services, right? Uh, well, it depends on, no. If it was the, the, the service fee was for these would be services, right? Okay. If, and, and we had, if you were expanding, the case of how you'd be expanding that if you're saying building something, that didn't happen. But it would fall under in, uh, expand current home spread in the for new emergency shelter beds. That makes sense. Okay, so it splits up basically between services and the capital gain. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second thing is I noticed you said that the, with the, you all had gotten the homeless input and none of the top three for them were shelter beds. I was just curious how many of the homeless that you all spoke to and where those were at? I think we had about 30 people and they were in San Benito, they were in Salinas twice, and one's on the peninsula. Okay. Were those people in shelters that were interviewed? I think some were, some were not. I want, yes, one group, know was, portion or? one group I don't. One group was in a shelter. Uh -huh. uh, the rest of them, I mean, you know, we try not to target it in that way. Um, could you want a broad representation of the input as possible? And just one more thing. I've heard him talking about making a subset for the specific shelters. Um, and I haven't heard anything about a Monterey shelter, even though that seems to be one of the top priorities that the professionals came up with. Selena seems to be the only game in town as far as the shelter, and we seem to think we're getting almost all of the money, if not all of it. 
Uh, but um, so if there's Salinas is going to be a subset, I just wonder if you should talk. If, if I've talked to homeless advocates who disagree with the location. I think it's not an effective location. They're moving them out of Chinatown because the business owners down there, as of a year ago, said they didn't want that problem downtown. Um, and so I just think there needs to be more community engagement with those that would be most effective. Well, there's, and I will just say to everyone in the room, there is a limit to the amount of community engagement we do. And I was just on the phone, a conference call, he was extra extraordinarily impressed with the deep level of community engagement we've done. We've done a lot more than a lot, many more people are doing. And as I explained to you, and I think one of the meetings, you know, nothing is a poor job if we do. No project has been funded yet. You know, we're just kind of walking into that process right now. And, and I'll just answer that it's not, there is serious conversation about shelter in the peninsula, whether it's Monterey, Seaside, or Marina. Um, and second, the sites that we looked in Salinas did involve the providers. They were actually on the, the number of site visits we did from the very beginning included all of all the uh, homeless providers. I've heard generic talk about a shelter on the peninsula in the future. I've not heard anything about the concrete. So for San we're going to nail this down by a shelter in Salinas and a shelter in Monterey. I just think it needs to we need to be more clear about what we're talking about. But we're going to get there. Um, other other members of the public. Let's let's go this order you first, and then Bill next. Yes. Hi. Thanks. Um, I, I would got to be in a couple of sessions. Uh, just a couple observations. One is a lot of the public didn't know uh, both what is available in terms of services or also solutions that, that were brought up by division providers uh, that were part of the group. So there was a lot of explaining that had to go on. But one thing I noticed is there was a guy that was used, <coughs> excuse my voice, at the tables that had nothing around transitional or permanent supportive housing on that, on that guide sheet. So I was curious to see how frequently that came up and, and if that wasn't discussed or came up with a solution why housing wasn't uh, wasn't on that on that discussion. Housing was discussed in all the groups. Um, what came up came up. Uh, you know, I think that there are uh, if you look at the full report you'll see that it, it is listed a couple times. Did it rise to the top? No. I don't know. Well so my observation was the stuff that did come up to the top was all on that guide sheet. Permanent and transitional housing wasn't on there shelter if I remember correctly. Uh, so, so that wasn't an option, if you will, for people to choose from. Bill? Uh, uh, Bill Harris again. I did go to three of the meetings in Monterey County. I went to the one with uh, Mary Adams and the round table of about 25 or 30 <coughs> citizens there. Nothing was discussed about what was happening with this heat. Uh, almost emergency aid program, what was happening as the meeting was being held at the library in Monterey. They didn't say the money has pretty much been decided where the money is going to for the homeless shelters. I would say too, the Vietnam Memorial was right there and it's been, uh, say, let's say been damaged by uh, different people, uh, juveniles or homeless from time to time. Just spent $200,000 to clean up Creek Bridge area behind our residence and the uh, shopping center. And uh, I guess that's enough to say on how much money and how much problems we have in Creek Bridge already that the city can't take care of. And then now they're gonna uh, put these homeless shelters on the most dangerous areas highway intersections of Natividad and East Laurel, and that's not talked about. And one other thing, the, the meeting at Seaside, I don't know how much, how many times this happened, we had representatives from the city of Salinas there monitoring what was going on and, and confronting the people that was presenting the, the, the questionnaire. And they know who they are, I know who they were, and I thought that was inappropriate to have the city of Salinas representatives there at the seaside meeting. What's going on here? Anyway, thank you. 
Thank you, sir. But everyone was welcome to all, all of you. Yeah. Some, we had some people from Venezuela come to Salinas, some Salinas over there. I even attended a medium last week with a lot of the elected officials from Marina. So we're in this because it's a regional approach. And we're trying to encourage that, that it's not just one city versus another. We try to find regional solutions to a growing crisis. Other, other members of the public haven't spoken? Okay. No. Yes. The stage. Just one other thing, I mean, beyond all the excellent you know, public engagement, and I was able to make all four meetings, and also with the senior meeting, which was very informative, um, I really was glad to do that. Uh, I learned a lot, and um, but beyond all the engagement and all the ideas, we still have to stick to some sort of a plan. We still need to prioritize and plan, and then keep in mind the community engagement. Anyone else? I'd like to mention one, one thing that happened between the last leadership council meeting that we had and now is we had an election. And there's six billion dollars uh, coming down from the state for housing. And two billion of it is uh, almost uh, related. So I don't know if we want to take that into some of this discussion, but the fact is that we're going to have a lot more uh, opportunity to partner with the state in the coming years. So while this is the temporary aid, the next, you know, short term, um, we probably should be thinking about longer term solutions as well. And how the, how the short term money fits into a long, longer term strategy. Yeah, and, and uh, we did mention that in our last meeting because our focus was to get heat because of the deadlines, right? But but we're, we're putting all this in context, just like what I mentioned earlier, what I mentioned earlier, is that all this information we're gathering, we're talking about heat now because of the imminent application that's due, but with new resources coming around the corner to local governments, Prop 1, $4 billion, or $3 billion, but a um, billion of that is for, for um, home buying for veterans, um, but the other $2 billion for, for under Prop 2, um, and there's SB2 also, which is the permanent uh, a quarter of a billion dollars coming to local governments for affordable housing. Those are all new funding sources that we hope to, whatever we're gathering, that there will be tools and guidance for us to hear another project with as those new funds kick in uh, and become available. Um, and what, we could move on to the next second. Is there anything else? <laughs> so, keep everything you said in mind, and that's in front of you. And now we need to move into the information that's required from you so that I can submit the initial application. And remember that the goal here is that I, I submit the application either the very last day of November or the first two days of this day. Right? Um, is still saying there's a 60 day term, just to um, um, So, what is needed? So, just to the gratification of, of, of the audience, the initial application is extraordinarily general. Okay? So, um, part of what I have to submit is initial funding estimates per very broad categories. And the categories in the application are services, so when you saw in the previous presentation, enhanced client services, street outreach, things like that, that falls in the service category, okay? And then rental assistance and subsidies, so when you saw moving costs, rental subsidies, rapid housing, that falls into, right, into rental assistance and subsidies. Uh, capital improvement, that's where your bills come in. You want to build something, buy something, or rehab something. And that would be for either emergency shelter beds, transitional housing, or other housing, right? Uh, homeless set aside, uh, uh, just remember it required, and then admin. So to remember, the funding percentages submitted in the initial application are not binding at the local level. That's the decision that you made, right? I just want to underscore that. That's the decision that you made. Change orders are to be expected. Uh, and the leadership council is to make targeted local funding decisions pursuant to however you want to do it as the, the, the guts of the RFP are developed. So again, the available funding is 11 million 87 and 78 cents is available after that. 
he has drilled it into everyone that you must be to the penny. If they, because remember how previously I told you that you know they have round one and then you fall into round two. They do that strange thing, the money bucket stuff, and they do this reallocation. If you leave one penny on the table, you put money on the table, which is insane. So now I'm just completely paranoid about rounding and my calculator, right? Altogether, this is that 12.5. Yes. We're talking about it. correct. Yeah. And remember that a minimum of five percent must be targeted to youth pro homeless youth programs, which as a minimum is 6.5 to 6. And remember also that when you're talking about service delivery time frames, depending upon what the program or activity is, you're really looking at like two year window. So if you fund something at a million dollars, you're really talking about five hundred thousand, really, a year. Can I have a question? Uh, yeah. Sorry, go back. So you mentioned a uh, so I so after available after administration. So there's about five percent that's available for administration. Correct. Correct. Uh, so uh, is that is that for for? Can you describe what the where the administration money is going to get expended. Right, the administration money will, will be spent in two places. One, we partnered with the County of Monterey, the Department of Social Service, to be our financial manager. So they'll do all our billing, all our financial reports, and you'll be receiving on a monthly basis, all of that kind of stuff. The second piece is that we need to have an extremely robust monitoring process. So the coalition intends to hire someone to do that. Um, during the grant period? Correct, during the grant period. Okay. And then I, you're probably going to get to it, and I just think, Sorry to uh, get ahead here. But uh, one of the other critical things, of course, is that this money has to be expended within a very specific Correct. time frame. So I'm real sensitive you know, to what Matt brought up about uh, housing elements, these, I feel like housing element, that's a loaded term, about mm -hmm. housing projects and, and housing discussion. And we all realize it's a critical need, but whatever project uh, gets embarked upon, I mean, all the money's got to be expended by a certain period of time. Well, it has to be uh, encumbered by a certain period of time and completely expended. There, if there is no, uh, by 2021, there is no extension. Any right. money that is not expended must be returned to the state of California. Right. So, so that, I just, my point being is that that's going to help define the projects as well. Correct. And it's also the reason why an extraordinarily robust monitoring system must be put into play so that this group knows in advance. If there's a program that's not meeting its timelines, not meeting its performance measure, so that they can make the, he can make the determination as a group if they want to take that money, the rest of that money from that program and reallocate it. Um, so that means it has to be looking all, constantly. Um, so <coughs> just pass out another. Okay, we'll get, can we get some more questions? Oh, here? Yeah, one. Robin. Is part of the administration going to be doing the program monitoring of each project goals and objectives? So there's an evaluation component to it? Absolutely. Other questions? We'll just say it. So it's, what is it fiscal year 2021? Or is it kind of year? Um, I'll have to go back and look. There's, a, there's an actual drop dead date on it. We would just have to pay attention. Yeah, I guess yeah, we have to pay attention to it. Other board members first? Second, okay, public? Go ahead, Stephen. I just wanted to talk about the admin and uh, one of the big things that I noticed throughout all of the meetings is there's a lack of capacity for cities and communities to implement homeless work, uh, housing work. It would be maybe pretty great if the county can, you know, we're talking about 625,000, that's the 5% set aside for youth, it's 5% for admin, correct? Correct. So maybe thinking about how do we beef up um, our outreach and our technical assistance throughout the county to um, areas that may not have the technical assistance that they need or the staff capacity that they need. Other members of the public? So the same thing, how do you where we got to work So probably a lot of people moving through it. Okay. So what I've done is I've prepared five options for your consideration. Right? What I've passed around are just some screen caps of what you see here. Again, in case you want to go back and forth, right? 
Uh, and so you may select a presented option, or you can modify it however you need to. But if you want me to submit for the time frame that that we need to do, I need to have this by the end of the day. So option number one, option number one is to take 20, and let me just remind everyone that this is the, um, uh, uh, you'll see that, that the totals are always going to end up to be 12 million, right? 12, 5, 5, 2, 50, 30 cents for the penny. Uh, so this is just an option that says the services you would put 25 percent uh, percentage of that, which would be 28 or 2 million 800 thousand of the change. You would put 25 percent, which is the same amount during rental subsidies uh, and uh, rental assistance. If you put 50 percent for capital improvements, that's 5 million 600 thousand of the change. Uh, the youth set aside of 5 percent is 6.1. And that then is going to always be the same at 6.5. So that's option number one, right? So you want to think to yourself, based upon the community engagement and your own knowledge, right? You know, what feels right to you. Um, option number two. Let, let's, let, let's go through the slides first and then we'll come back to that. That really be happy. Yeah. So option number two. Remember, you got a lot of things that qualify as services, advanced client services, free documents, all that kind of stuff. So if you beef up services to 40%, that means you have 4.5 million to change your services. If you take down rental assistance and subsidies, you have to 20%, you have $2.2 million. Remember, with rental assistance and subsidies, it can be really, it can be somewhat difficult because people have to have a place to go to in this market. It's a tough one, right? So if, if you wanted to go go 40% of capital improvements, that would be four million five hundred thousand and change. Again, at five percent it'd be almost set aside at 6.5, and the admin is always going to be 6.5. Option number three takes services to 30%, which would be a little over three million dollars, takes rental assistance and subsidies down to 10% for a little over a million dollars. That's the kind of worst case scenario that get hard to get people into housing. Uh, capital improvement bucks up to 60%, which would be $6.7 million. The home set aside debt for youth is 5%, which is 6.5, and admin is 6.5. Option four keeps services at 40%, which is 4.5 million. The rental subsidy would keep it at 10 at 1.1 million. So you put it say one program for that. You have a program that would be half a million dollars a year for two years. Capital improvements at 50% would be 5.6 million. The homeless need to set aside 6.5. That would be 6.5. We're almost done. Sorry, God. Last option uh, that I was playing around with is services putting it up at 35%, which is 3.8 million dollars. Rental subsidies and assistance, rental assistance, property housing, things of that nature, 20%, which is 2.2 million. Capital improvements at 40%, which is 4.5. Taking the youth set aside to 10% is 1.2 million. And then administration is 6.5. So you can make whatever decisions you want to make. Um, it just has to, the homeless youth set aside has to say 6.5, at least minimum 5%. Uh, at least to say 5%. And it has to add up. <laughs> The 12 million, 500 million, to the penny, uh, a little flat 12.5 million. Okay, we, we got, um, these are, to get the discussions going, but any of these could always be adjusted. Absolutely. Like, these are just five proposals to get us on. Absolutely. So if, if you said, for example, and I'm just making it up, right, that you wanted to do 20% for services, let's say, right? But then you go through the RFP process and it doesn't balance out. Right? You say, oh wow, I really would prefer, in the end of the day, it really looks like like 35%. That's not a big deal, right? It's just a change order. Right? I said to go to the state and say, you know, we originally told you it was going to be 20%, it's actually going to be 35%. And as long as it equals up to 12 million, we're fine. Right, so this would be guidance, but they can be changed in the future. Right? Absolutely. But this would be a goal from the outset, from the beginning, to try to say this is what we're aiming to accomplish 
Um, but in the end, we might have to make some adjustments. I'm going to take charge questions. I'm going to start with uh, Mayor Levera first, and then uh, Elsa, and then uh, Rafael. Thank you. Uh, no. uh, appreciate the work and all the information. Um, you didn't hear the same story I've always said. We need housing. We need beds. Um, the services are more beneficial if that person that you're helping has that place to stay. The services are more efficient and effective for every dollar that's spent. Um, I, would, I would not be in favor of funding services at anything more than, honestly, 5%. I think the bulk of this money should go into beds and housing. A person is homeless for one reason, is because they don't have a place to sleep. The issues that cause homelessness are issues that people even have houses face those types of things. Mental, addiction, economic, those are things that everybody struggles with. But homeless people do not have a place to live or a place to stay. It's a simple, even if it was a 150 square foot room, if they had a key with their own lock that they call their own, they're on a path moving ahead and forward. And for uh, services, it's much easier to connect with those people when we have them in a place that they're in a safer place, their inability to get the care that they need. So um, honestly, I would go five on services, 10 to 15 on rental assistance, because that is housing. I would go 70, 75 on capital improvements, and five and five for homeless and administration. <coughs> Wherever we can maximize those dollars with already budgets that are, um, there are services that are doing those things because on the home that you set aside, we have services that are providing some of that, so some of that money is going to be going to services. On the rental assistance subsidies, we have people providing that service, so those monies actually be going to those services anyway. So I, I, that's where I'm at. I, full on, we just need to get beds in place. We can get this done in time. That is not the problem. We just need to make this decision. We need to have that application in done by, I would say, no later than the 5th of December. It has to be done. Um, my understanding is there's already been other um, entities that have received their funding because they put their grant funds or grants in early. And as you said earlier, Catherine, they were probably. I would imagine that the heap was talking about their applications. They did not have the community engagement that we <laughs> So um, that's that's my position. Okay, we'll go over the dates before the end of the meeting. Just what date are we aiming to have everything turned in? Oh, it has to be yeah. a drop dead date to go into round one is December thirty first, and I would not be comfortable going that far just because it's an, it's an uh, online submission and that those can always go weirdly. And do we have a, a meeting? What's our meeting schedule for? We, not, we are not on the schedule, but it's on the agenda to talk about. So we'll get to getting a meeting date. So we should have one more meeting before we submit um, our application. Well, we should not. We should be able to do it today. We should really get the information. Perfect. Even yeah. better. Thank you. That's good. Right. Okay, I, I got a list of speakers. I got to go with Elsa, then uh, Ralph, then Jim, then Matt, then. Um, The other thing, if we invest a lot of this money on services, what are we going to do when this money runs out in terms of the integration of services? I think this is a unique opportunity to identify what other funding sources. I know Elliot asked, or somebody asked earlier, I just want to remind this group, 50% of this money must be contractually obligated by January 1st of 2020, and 100% of it must be fully extended by June 30th of 2021. So I have a couple of questions for you, Catherine. When we look at the services, going back to the top four, mm -hmm. Is that items two and three, meaning enhanced client services, landlord mitigation, street outreach, etc.? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to, I'm hearing a lot of like community input from Monterey County, but I'm not really sure what kind of community input or San Bernardino County already has a plan. And I'm wondering how these options kind of uh, balance to what San Bernardino County is looking at in terms of their spending. And then these percentages would be for the overall bucket. So if San Bernardino County wanted to spend all their money in capital, let's say, that would be okay as long as it's total? Okay. Okay. Or is that the last meeting? Yes. Uh, it was, it's okay, I understood. It was voted on in the SBR by two counties, 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 two 
$1.8 million. And I know that their intent is mostly on school outreach. Okay. So then that one, their full allocation would have to fit in the Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, and we voted on that at our last meeting. <coughs> okay, uh, next speaker, the uh, mayor review. Yeah, it sure comes no surprise that I agree with uh, Mayor Lovera and uh, his minutes on uh, favoring uh, a majority of this going to brick and mortar and uh, creating spaces for our folks. Um, Mayor Doug has told us that $5 million for the, the shelter and so you know, we're thinking about another shelter on the peninsula. We're going to need somewhere close to that to be able to do that, to replicate that. Uh, I don't know what grants they have in line for that. But uh, the, thing, the question I had was uh, regarding this uh, navigation team. What exactly is that? And it seems that we've got enough <coughs> service providers you know, working together in a close-knit group, talking to all these people. Now, we're already in a sort of a navigation team for um, we, we really don't. I mean, there are, there are, there are certain nonprofits who have housing navigators for their own programs. What we lack, though, is housing navigation for the continuum in general, right? To, to again, to work with landlords, to identify the very few precious units that we have in this continuum, and to lead people to them. That's what the housing navigation team does. Okay, so my follow up question on that is. Can that be handled to continue the uh, navigation, uh, community navigation team? Can that be handled through the, through the continuum rather than taking these funds for that? I would rather see it put into the, the shelters. That would be up to the nonprofits who would be willing to do that extra work with no resources involved. Resource. Well. There would be no continuum funding for it. I mean, if, if this group decided that that would not be relevant. Okay, let's go to San Benito County. Yes, yeah. sir. And <coughs> the answer the, the, with, um, also, also, just sure. give it to you what you're right. I'm glad uh, to recognize the people who heard me in the past meetings. <coughs> uh, San Benito County, uh, we are arguing that this point in time means more towards services. We have our shelter in place. Mm -hmm. we're, we're moving towards transitional housing. We're looking at other sources for long-term permanent <coughs> uh, And what's really been identified in our community is the outreach to those folks who are not yet engaged with services. So that's what we wanted to do, uh, move uh, with uh, these funds. So uh, we support <coughs> some good music over there. The bottom of the place. For your entertainment. It was just for effect, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we support the efforts of the United County. We want to do what we can, you know, to help you. Move along in that way. Uh, we do ask that uh, you kind of uh, help us kind of move in the direction that we think we'd like to go. And that's all that we need And I would point out that San Benito is ahead of the game because they got some CB CBG funds and other funds and already invested in brick and mortar. They got the shelter they didn't have and they did a really good job of picking that up. So now they're moving to the next phase of trying to get services to you know, get people housed. Um, I got, uh, let's say I got Matt, then Elliot, um, who else? Um, Lena. Okay. And then, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Matt. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things and um, put, put, put that on the table. But one thing was uh, not often do we find that the most impacted people actually agree with the uh, professional class of folks in terms of the, the folks that study those people. And so it just, to me, was kind of striking that, number one, seem to mirror each other in terms of the enhanced, uh, you know, the navigation piece and, and the um, client services piece. So I think that there's something there in terms of listening to the community, the most impacted <coughs> folks, and the folks that are, are doing the, the data gathering and the servicing. So um, to the extent that that 
uh, locks us into a higher or, or a meaningful percentage for that. I, I think there's a case there. Um, secondly, I really like the conversation. I think I think it was what we hear that you had last time and raised it again about the youth. And just the whole aspect of it's not that much money at the end of the day, but what it does is it's gonna let's let's use it to fix some problems. You know, we have a hundred problems, let's fix three or four or five of them, whatever. But let's get those done. And so maybe one of those getting those things done is truly attacking this atrocious problem that we have with families and children living on the free streets in our county. That's unacceptable. I mean, there's not one of us that finds that acceptable. So let's do something about that and target a robust percentage toward getting that done. And I don't know what that is, but I don't think it's 5%. Yep. Let's go to Elliot. You know, I just going to point out, you know, and very similar to what um, there was said, when we had the um, emergency funding for practical housing, there was a big spike in, in federal money um, that was contracted with HRC. When that grant period ended, it was almost no compensation. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to pay attention to that. <laughs> Capital certainly is one time in nature. Um, and at some point, we also had, I think, an expansion of the ESG funding that can also have contributed to the services. So and I think that you know, having a sufficient kind of dollar amount there to make sure that the um, kind of CNS area shelter can go forward, and that's valuable in that there's actually land that's identified, which is probably hardest things that we um, Peninsula needs something, but if you set aside too much to get there and they don't, you know, they go from here to get land, then, then they're lost. So you need to set aside something so that they're going to move forward. But, you know, certainly paying attention to the capital improvement side, you know, I lean towards the 60% there. It's, it's hard for me to know between the, the services, because I think, you know, what, what you said is, you know, that's kind of on the services side, that's where both the professional community and the impact <coughs> And so we, we have to pay attention to the longevity of the organizations because, you know, I didn't live through the HRC challenge from the HRC side, but I certainly lived through it from the um, contract management side, which is very aware of how painful that was for that organization and how that almost took out one of our, our most, uh, one of our strongest home service providers. Okay. Um, I. My instinct is to put more money in her rental assistance and subsidies. <clears throat> the capital improvements, she's what builds things. I always love the idea of money going to capital improvements, but I heard your, I can't remember it, but it, it stung me a little bit. What was the deadline on spending this? Yeah. 20 or 21. <clears throat> there, unless you have something that is ready to start building tomorrow and has all the rest of its funding, you won't spend mm -hmm. this. Time. So somebody who's sitting as their child is sleeping in the hallway of someone else's apartment, they're just as homeless, or about to be just as homeless as somebody moving into a shelter. It's just that you can reach them more quickly. You can give them a subsidy, you can give them a down payment or a deposit. You can get them somewhere quickly because they're just as homeless as somebody on the street. Just right. Um, I would like to just echo that, that you know, every affordable housing developer and every housing developer that I've spoken to since this opportunity came up, they all said exactly the same thing. Be aware of project readiness because, you know, everybody wants flexibility, right? But when you're talking bricks and sticks and you're talking about a change your window, you've got to have claw back things in those, uh, in those RFPs that if, if you don't want you to expend by milestone, $2 million, I want to find out that your agency cannot deliver, right? So that agency is going to have to guarantee, right, that they're going to deliver. Just the conversation. Um, it's just how long it takes to bring up housing. Um, he says that most capital, we're looking at it differently, right? That most capital projects are that are that are heat funded or will be heat funded are really those that are ready to go. They just need a little piece of money. It's just still a niche money that they haven't gotten yet. Whereas <coughs> Honestly, we handed this money to Cheryl County, and she talked to all her parents. And she was living, living, living in two, you know, three families to an apartment, and others. But I mean, somebody was right there on the ground with these people. 
who knows who would benefit from not becoming homeless. That's a pretty homeless. Somebody who's on the cusp of it. Well, it only takes, you know, a thousand dollars. We talked about that at the last meeting. That's a difference category three. And the Leadership Council decided that that up to five percent can be used for that definition. But if they were homeless, then they're not category three. Yeah, correct. Yeah. They're, they're, they're homeless. Still okay. 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 okay, that's right. Okay. Construction sounds great. It always sounds good. But yeah, I don't but, think it's good way to design. Right, but Salinas is, is our project is it would be done in 18 months. Um, a project on the ship peninsula would be probably have to be an existing building that could be brought up to code to be a, a shelter. But it also could mean existing rooms and, and housing stock that's dilapidated that needs to be brought up to um, to meet the needs of, 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 um, of current housing code standards. Mr. Chair, there's a follow-up question that I think yeah, that Jersey might be able to oh. answer, which is how effective are we at finding housing today? So this is sometimes becoming a very challenging goal. Finding housing is um, obviously it's not very easy. Um, and once we do find housing, a lot of them aren't up to code, and they don't fit HUD standard definitions, therefore we can't use it, and so landlord's not willing to make those repairs needed, so then our funding, our stream gets a bit smaller. I would say on average, in a week's time, we submit five, six applications for, I mean, we have 80, a little under 80 clients at a time. So it really, there's not a whole lot of units out there. Sometimes we have to apply two clients to the same unit to see which one the landlord picks. It's uh, the housing supply is very short. And, and well, the demand is much higher than the supply. And community yeah. home solutions in here, but they have some some units that are not being used because they're not up to code. So those would be like just another just giving examples of stuff that could be done within the, the immediate time frame. Um, <coughs> Okay, I gotta go back over to our speaking order. Amanda, you're next. Uh, I, to see? No, uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with more units or something that this meeting is showing me, but you know, we talked to Dana and others. Bit, kind of <coughs> Having talked to Dana and others, I know that, you know, and I'll just pretend that a grand, uh, a grand opening of a, of a project in Monterey that, you know, with uh, Betsy's group, it took them five years, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe longer. I mean, the, the time it takes to build anything is very, very long. And that's a, you know, so I, I just wanted to bring that up because that's the reality. Uh, I think that the money coming down from the state, I don't know if the money, can the money be used for like site work, uh, paying for uh, uh, des designs, the architects, is that part of the... It can, as long as it falls into the timeline. Well, I think that, I mean, that might be doable, but... Does the building have to be within the timeline or you have to spend this money on the building? No, it has to be, the project has to be done. Yeah. Uh, so, so it has to be renovation of something that somebody already owns. It's all, it just needs to be put <laughs> And then on the, on the rental assistance side, uh, I mean, we have almost 180 people looking for units right now at the house. And they are given 180 days to find a unit because there are not enough units. And based on what you said earlier about two or three, the reason is because there's not enough available units now and if we find them then we have to pay to pass the HQS which a lot of them can a lot of landlords are going to upgrade their units and they have to be able to them. So that that creates I mean I would love to have more I mean you know Jimmy can have asked me what I would like. I said it'd be great to ask for more vouchers but I can't use them because I don't have enough stock <coughs> to help you know 200 additional families. I have 200 families looking for them. If you you know you, they're probably competing against the you know the, the folks that you're trying to help. So, I mean, that's that's the issue, is that the lack of units or, I mean, services, is, you know, whether it be the youth, whether it be the uh, elderly, or, or especially the homeless, I mean, they're all three tied together. I think that's, you know, I think that's where I see where we could make a, a, a huge impact in, uh, you know, figuring out how to, to, to find uh, suitable land somewhere that we're not, you know, and we've heard the opposition is leading to the shelter <coughs> solutions. I can't really imagine what it's going to be like tomorrow. Okay. Well, then we're going to see, but I do want to recognize the new director of housing authority. He did his first well, recognition event for Lander to do have our, our rent to Section 8 tenants, which is the first time it ever happened, but I, I'm glad there's a, more uh, events to help foster that, a good relationship and, and recognize landlords who are doing the right thing. ATC. Uh, a couple of points. I want to start with the guidance. I'm looking at Governor Brown's frequently asked question on heat funding. 
It says applicants must include how the proposed activity is directly related to providing immediate emergency assistance to people experiencing homelessness or imminent risk of homelessness, and that those uses are aligned with California's housing first. Yes. The housing first policy stresses social services and care coordination are necessary elements. I think it's very critical that we build that in to a treat uh, a standard of treatment that can be progressive so that these people can work their way out of homelessness to be in a permanent living situation at the end of it. That being said, I'm looking at the five options presented here. These are not required to have all five. And I'm kind of looking at rental assistance and subsidies. We said the funding is running out. So my question is if we take if we add that and we can't spend the money, if we could lose the money. And second, if we do give them the money, it may not be sustainable beyond the life of this fund. So I would question that second item, whether we need to have it to any degree, let alone the percentage of zero. The rental assistance. The rental assistance. Um, I agree with capital improvements. I think it needs to be 50% or higher for all the reasons that were said. But I do think we're distributing these funds over a couple smaller projects. It's not one $5 million project. It's two or three smaller projects. I have money and we <coughs> renovate and we do new construction here and it can be spent if you have money in hand and you plan ahead. So I do feel this is possible. Okay, um, you're right, we can't take one of these categories out, but also if we do include it, we can't change it later through the change order process. Right. That we, just <coughs> we got uh, Robin, then uh, Councilman Pacheco. Yes. I just want to ask the group to pause for a minute and think about the needs of unaccompanied homeless youth. There's a 5% minimum set aside for unaccompanied homeless youth ages 18 to 24. Their needs are unique and they are not the same as the needs for homeless adults. Just as an example, rapid rehousing homeless prevention and landlord tenant negotiations are not effective strategies for youth who are 18 to 24. Um, so, for many of them, like rapid rehab, would be going back to their parents' home to you and which is a family counseling. So anyway, um, the homeless youth were 21% uh, of the homeless census. I think 5% is too low to do something effective for youth. Um, that money, 600 something, 25,000 is 312 a year. Uh, so that's not a lot to get something of impact for an accompanied youth 18 to 24, I'd like to propose that the minimum be raised to 10%. So please stop and think about that for a moment. Okay, Mr. Pacheco. Just really simple. I think, you know, a long-term solution is a capital improvement. I think just 60%, I think, to get the minimum, because that's going to solve, hopefully, a beginning of a solution. So I just want to point that out. I think capital improvement is vital. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor Rubio, and then uh, Councilman Barrett. Uh, yeah, um, I like what Kurt was saying. Um, there are opportunities out there. Um, it may even be, you know, buying a part of an apartment complex or buying a a motel. Uh, going back to uh, going back to the army and seeing if they want to sell off a block of you know ten or fifteen houses that they're not. In, in, uh, in their inventory right now. Uh, they just need to be re refurbished and put back in into the inventory. We did it once, we can do it again. Uh, I, you know, the idea is to have that money available to be able to say, yes, we've got the money, we'll do it. And you know, I, I reiterate my staff, there should be uh, a good portion of that. Monterey okay. Councilman, thank you. So there's, there's uh, no doubt there's a lot of support in the room for uh, infrastructure investment, and uh, that's a lot of that conversation is taking the form of homeless shelter or shelters, which is probably very appropriate. I would say though that no matter how much money we put into a homeless shelter or homeless shelters, we're not going to provide enough capacity to bring everyone who's currently unhoused into the shelters. So that means then that we still need to be able to engage with housing that's already existing in the private sector. And we do a homeless census every two years. In the homeless census, there's a variety of categories that people say are the factors that are keeping them out of housing. 
And if I remember correctly, 35% of the time, it's move-in costs. So if we're going to build a shelter, we can't imagine everyone's going to be able to fit into that shelter. People that are almost ready to go into housing but just can't quite make it because of one type of move-in costs or another, perhaps can be facilitated into housing that already exists. And essentially, that's an argument for providing um, rental assistance. And I think when you hear rental assistance, you're imagining, well, we're just going to give a person $500 a month or something, and then that money's going to run out. But I think rental assistance can take a variety, variety of different forms, and it doesn't have to be just that kind of thing. And then I just have one question to add on to that. So I'm, I'm supporting some level of rental assistance um, in some sort of imaginary, imaginative way to deliver those services. Um, but a question. So in addition to building shelter or shelters, some of these funds could be put towards retrofitting or improving existing housing to make it um, appropriate for people to move into. Now, I have to wonder then, is that done through a deed restriction to certain income levels? Or then would that housing be set aside just for people who are currently unhoused and or would remain unhoused? So in other words, would we be taking housing off the market for uh, low-income people generally, just for a subset? Or would the mechanism be for retrofitting existing housing um, an income standard rather than uh, the condition of being currently in a home? I can answer that question. You would be what it is for the homeless population. Um, and there, there, that would be a landlord mitigation fund, if you will. So it would be um, someone has identified an apartment that they would like to accept Section 8, let's say, but they can't because it's not up to code, right? So there's a certain amount of money that can be applied to do the improvements in that apartment. And the deal could be something like, I was making it up, that you know, the landlord will agree to take on this particular person for a minimum of a year's lease, right? There's some risk to that, that at the end of that, at the end of that time, the landlord can say, I'm not going to do any more. But that's the risk that people take when they do landlord mitigation funds. It doesn't take, it, it counts in heat as long as it's creating new beds, right? It would, it would have, it has to be new beds. Um, or that a homeless person can access. What line does that come in? That what you just described is that subsidy or is that capital? It's not capital. It's services. It's services. services. Yeah, right. So it's line two. Yeah. Okay. Other board members first, or other elected officials in the room. Okay. Clarification. Wait a minute. Let me go over the folks who haven't spoken, and we'll come back to you, man. Just to listening to everyone, and then thinking about our homeless families in Monterey County. You know, there's over 9,000 homeless children. And of course, that's from the ones we've identified from preschool through 12th grade. And in our district alone, I've said this before, over 3,300 kids. But there's scenario, and they don't fall into the HUD. Some do, some don't, most don't. But they're renting sections of hallways. I mean, besides all the garages and tool sheds and walk-in closets that they're renting, but it's inadequate, it's it's improper for them, but it's better than living in a vehicle they may have. But the biggest thing, and I've, and I've been in the, the warming shelter quite a bit in the last couple weeks, is that the warming shelter and um, KQE came down from San Francisco for two straight days, so we interviewed quite a few families. But the warming shelter, listening to these parents speak and the kids, is really a safe haven for them where they know transportation can be provided for their kids, there's folks in there doing some <coughs> proactive services. It gives them time to save money where they don't have to run a hotel or pay somebody for renting a room or whatnot. But there's a sense of peace around it that until I really sat through these interviews two weeks ago, I didn't realize how valuable the place is. I knew it had been for the last six years, but that when you have 35 kids, you know, and it's been up to 50 kids at one point, there's just not enough space, let alone for the single women and the single men 
and the one and our youth from 18 to 24, if they wanted to, they could go into that place as well. But once they're in a place like that, they seem to be more at peace and not as stressed. There's a meal provided every night. There are restrooms, no showers or anything there. But Chinatown Health Center is great for that. But it gives them, the parents and the kids, um, a place to call home. And they called it that during these interviews, that it was home. And I really had not weighed the importance of that in previous years. So by having more beds, it, it leaves the parents open to, and to receive services. Therefore, hopefully they can get to a point where maybe they can't pass the background or the, the criminal background check or credit check, but maybe a credit deposit, first and the last one, one time to be able to get them in after services have been provided, but it seems like that could be a possible continuum to help our, our families out. And I know they may or may not be included in this too. And who did you say King Dolphin? Can I get you this? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you They're going to have a huge okay. series. That's good. Um, the mayor there, and then uh, Robin. Robin? Robin? Oh, okay. Um, just want to say a lot of great input. I appreciate it. Um, we're not going to solve everybody's problem with this money. But what we have the opportunity right now to do is actually solve a problem for many people. It may only be three or four hundred people, it matters how many beds we get in place. And some of those beds can be converted for units for family members, just as she had spoke about. But we're not going to help everybody that's homeless in this county or in San Benito with this money. It's one-time money. The best thing we can do is get actual facilities in place because we've already made a commitment at city levels and county levels on their expending on the service levels. We can make that happen. We can get this built within the time frame. That that is not that's not even a question. We're going to go to Mayor Rubio, then we're going to uh, go to the public. We'll go to Mayor Rubio, uh, Mr. Baldwin, then we'll go to the public, then we'll come back to the board. Okay, well, I, I wanted to float out an option. I know we've been talking about a lot of different things, but I wanted to put out an option that uh, started with 65% uh, to capital improvement, 10 to services, 10 to rental assistance, and 10 to, new, uh, to homeless youth with the 5 to administration. Okay, um, Paul? Uh, it's, you know, it's really extraordinary to hear um, the passion that people are bringing, and uh, certainly people come from different parts of the sector and service providing and, and that's that's admirable. There's nothing there's nothing at all uh, to be critical about in bringing their passion into the conversation. Uh, and I realize we're we're sort of up against a little bit of a time frame here, but shouldn't we really be looking at what is the best um, strategic use of this money and how can this money be leveraged? And uh, uh, you know i talked to a lot of people for a long time about the challenges of not having like a commonly shared vision that they were all aligned in, and so we're kind of having to have this conversation a little bit on the fly. So I, I hosted a couple meetings uh, along with Supervisor Leho just to find out different status, who's ready, who's not, who's, got, who's, who's excited. Uh, one was in Salinas and then in one in my office with uh, representatives of Peninsula Cities. And, you know, one of the things that we learned is that Seaside's got money and they're, they're ready to go. And, and so, so that's, that's an opportunity to use some of this money to leverage um, what's already there and maybe have a multiplier effect from this money. Uh, VTC as plans, you know, they're they're ready, they're ready to go. So I realize that we're working a little bit in a vacuum. We got about seven chicken and egg scenarios that are kind of swirling around. Uh, uh, we, I think the decision that has to be made today is around some general percentages and the specifics uh, come later. So uh, uh, I don't know what the ability, and I realize this is probably meant to come through an RFP process rather than to be pushed, um, you know, from this end. But I don't know what the capacity is to utilize some of the time between now and the and the the submission date to uh, find out what some of the leverage points can be, where, where multipliers can be found, uh, you know. 
what a million dollars turns into a three or four million dollar uh, investment because, because there's already money there. I just think some of this needs to be taken into consideration so that we can really maximize uh, what the investment's going to be able to return. Thank you, Dan. We're going to now go to the public. Um, Jim Jim? Oh, well, <clears throat> just two things. One is our group said 10% for the new. So just so that's what our group San Diego said. Secondly, and I think I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. Heat money is, is to be considered rich money. And I like your thoughts on that. Uh, it's rich funding to Prop 1 and Prop 2, and other sources of funding that we can begin uh, to look at. Uh, so I'm hoping that early on next year, we can kind of morph this conversation into a kind of a five-year discussion or a seven-year discussion, and how can we you know, position ourselves to, to, to best use that Prop 1 and Prop 2 funds and other sources of funding that are available to our communities. Thank you, Jim. Okay, now now I'm the public. We'll start on this side. <coughs> uh, Anastasia, and we'll go here, and then, yeah. I, I just wanted to say that the, the um, percentages are a little off, because and you, you said that San Benito County's uh, funding is going to go under services mostly. Jim? Uh, I, I'm thinking about I think that uh, probably the majority of it will probably go towards services. We had some money in there. I don't have it in the right now. Oh, we had some money in there for uh, to support our current shelter operations. Um, but, uh, but mostly I think that in, in our group, there was a sense that we wanted to get out and begin to deal with those folks that we have engaged with who are still on the streets. Okay. So just, just making sure that you're factoring that San Benito's amounts haven't been you know, pulled out of each of these columns and then we're going to need to think about those percentages. The, uh, the initial application does not allow me the ability to separate by county. Right. That's why it's all in the county. And the same just the same deal that I so all the time that's going to be right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, let's go with this one and keep going up. Uh, Jan Mason with iHealth. Uh, so one question I have is where does shelter operation fall in these categories? That would be services. Um, and services can be service monies to be used for to support well services. Um, and it can be to support new expanded shelter beds. So for example, got to say and make it up two million dollars for a construction for a small shelter that bring 20 beds online then if there's money in services you can go to the services and pick up that but what you cannot do is you serve the money for existing programs right understood but my question is yes when you're thinking about capital improvements you got to think of the services to provide in that shelter so I don't want that to be cut down too small and forgotten. And my other thought was uh, thinking outside the box of just buildings, apartment buildings. You know, at times there have been suggestions of maybe an RV park or, you know, or a trailer park. Something that could happen more quickly than building from the ground up. Uh, as might be a quicker way to get something built that could have some people. Uh, so I had a few things. The first one is, I don't know how some of the folks in here are completely discounting services. Uh, when you look at the statistics, you look at the census count, and the census count says that 38% um, the primary cause of homelessness in Monterey County is, is drug or alcohol use, 15% is mental health. Nationally, we're talking about what we are suffering from, it is mental health and drug use, and 25 to 40% have drug or alcohol dependency. 33% of mental health, of course, the numbers are all over the place, but generally. 
So I don't think you can discount services when you're talking about building capital improvements. I've heard a lot about building capital improvements, but not cohesively including services with those. And I understand it's an emergency program, so it needs to be spent immediately. Uh, but services, how are you, we've been told these people are going to be either evicted or not allowed to get into the shelter if they're causing disturbances. But when you know such a large portion of them have these issues, uh, you're not helping them. And then eight, we're building 80 to 100 beds. That's the only project I've been told of. And so you're putting all this money, 75%, towards one project. That makes no sense. You're helping 80 to 100 people. I mean, I, I get it continues on. Um, I kind of like to know, and this is a question you all need to talk about, is what is the minimum amount Salinas needs to build their shelter? You can talk about percentages, but I've not heard concrete numbers, and maybe at San Benito when you can talk to what they spent. I know Anastasia's put a lot of work into it. Um, so we should have a general idea of what they need. I don't think I've heard that. Um, so I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I want to go to this. Yeah, I would just reiterate the need for uh, homeless youth programs. 21% of the homeless census were unaccompanied homeless youth or transition age homeless youth, and 93% were unsheltered. Um, that's a demographic that if they're not addressed now, they're going to grow up and become chronically homeless. That's going to be an issue 30 years ago. That's what you need for homeless youth programs. It's going to really take the things down the road. We have a very young population on our account. I think the average age is 34 years old. Okay, let's go down this way. Take us. Um, so I'm Betsy, I work for Midtown Housing, so I'm definitely like a capital person, right, like to build stuff. Um, but the idea of this money servicing a project that's going to be a ground up bill that doesn't have other money already committed to it, that's not already entitled, seems extremely unrealistic to me. So I, I understand the appeal of capital, and I think you know some comments in the room about acquisition and doing rehab, those are more realistic ways to potentially use this. <coughs> on a capital project. And just having done this for many, many years, you know, 18 months to finish a shelter from, from now, I, it's going to take you more than six months just to draw the drawings. So I, I've done this enough times, and, and the money that's available is not going to be adequate to fill that shelter. So I, I love it. I want to do it. But I also, it's possible that we lose the money if we are too high in the sky with our ideas and then we don't deliver on the other end. So that, that makes me nervous. I feel really nervous about something that's too ambitious with these constrained timelines. And someone also mentioned the money that's coming. There is permanent money coming, right? So we, we had two propositions passed. We have some federal resources. So there are monies available for when we are really ready. When this is not the last money. money. This is sort of last money. It's not. I mean, yeah. it's not. Well, we're time, please. Well, okay. Speaking of time. Well, she was just reinforcing what I was saying. So the other thing, I wanted to say two more things. One is, you know, we did all these community meetings, and the top priority was not capital. And it feels like we should have a discussion about why we're not reflecting that back, right? We have all these meetings, we ask for input, the top thing was not capital. And then my final comment is on these percentages, I hope they're, they're just targets, because depending on what you get, you know, you oh, need to absolutely. be able to move within that. So you might set targets, but then depending on the quality applications and the readiness, it's going to be different, right? And I would just say that that there's not one model of construction. There's, there's stick built. Um, the mm -hmm. Housing Authority rebuilt 50 units because it's prefabricated and, and put there. There's new models of housing that can be done much quicker and cheaper. Yes. I was going to say that Bernie and Edomi have been working on, we used to call them tiny homes, we don't call them that anymore because everyone thinks of them on trailers. <coughs> they moved into a lot, that's not what they're defined as anymore. Um, there, there are housing options that can be done quickly, and one of the relationships we have is with the prisons, and to actually build them in the prison and you know, produce them pretty quickly, uh, four or 800 square feet units, whatever is needed in create a tiny home village. We don't have to create the Taj Mahal, we've got to create that. And those work very well for beds. In fact, they could actually build a shelter in the prison in Folsom. And they could build it in modules that would be done in the time frame we're talking about. And by the way, you probably get, if you didn't get free labor, you'd get at cost labor. So it's going to be a lot less than, than what it's going to cost to build it uh, using prevailing wages and all that. Things. We know historically, Community Homeless Solutions has been in operation for 30 years. We know that if people move from shelter to transitional housing, the success rate goes up substantially in terms of both finding housing, but also becoming economically independent. And on average, in all our transitional housing, we have between 80 and 90% of our people stay on average about 13 months. Currently, has the same results in ETC. If we can get them settled down, if we can help them with employment, we can increase both their employment and find them housing, because as Cheryl said, they have time 
to settle down and feel safe and have time to focus on these issues that are critical to them. Uh, we know if they're in the shelter for 30 days, that drops around, or 30 or 60 days, then the success rate drops down to 20 or 45 percent. If they're on the street, it's even less. And iHealth, we ran that for years. We love iHealth. Five percent of our people were finding housing and employment um, because they're coming back over and over again. So they need the stability, they need the housing, they need the bed. They need to move actually from a shelter pretty quick to transitional housing because that's where they have the greatest stability and the high success rate. So, so big proponent of capital from that. <coughs> well, here, don't look up in the chair. Uh, Bill Harris again, a pretty fresh resident. And these two locations, go with, go see if you haven't been there. Sure. 220 and the Timidan. And the big one is right next to the Vietnam Memorial, right on the busy road of East Laurel. It's wrong location, they're booting on the location. And Creek Bridge and the other fine neighborhoods in the Creek Bridge area are being sacrificed. And we're going to reach this, we're going to remind you, all the boondoggles that you're going to do. Monterey County is in the red. They're $38 million in the red this year. The city is about ready to go belly up. They're paying police officers over $250,000, $350,000 a year. The firefighters, they're about ready to go bankrupt. Those locations are horrible. And you're sacrificing my neighborhood, our shopping centers, and they're against it. And 75% or more of the people don't know a damn thing about it. What's going on here? And I'm I'm going to uh, resist it the best I can. Anyway, uh, I said enough. We're going to jump to this side, but we don't have a, a, a budget deficit. We get in the year. We reach about budget, budget process for the county monitor. How many people you oh, fired? Yeah. Yes. We're going to, we got to give the public opportunity. We're going to wrap up here. Rosemary Axton, and I'm also with iHealth. And one of the things that I've seen over and over and over again in our work with men and women is that we have no place for people to go uh, 30, 60 days with us, maybe sometimes months with us, unless we have the workers to address how do you get a job, keeping the job, mental health issues that have gone on and on, addiction issues that have gone on and on. All of that takes staff, services equals staff. So I just want to say that we have to pay a lot of attention to that issue or people don't change <laughs> unless they get good attention over a long time and relationships are formed. I am very excited by the idea of small houses <clears throat> addressing maybe just 300 beds for women, say over 55 or 50, that we have no place to put them. And these could be women that we're able to work with intensively in services, getting ready to go into their own home, address those issues of addiction and mental health, etc. So that the housing that they get is a success, not housing that they lose. Anyway, I hope that there's room for a pilot project like that, especially if they can get houses built in a prison at cost, or I heard for free. You know, they only have to pay for the materials, and they have the land. They have the land to do it. I also wanted to say what Jan said, is that maybe doing just something like a, a motorhome park or a, a small thing like that to add to another segment of the population, homeless families, for example. Thank you. We're going to have to uh, wrap up public comments here because we have, we're have we running out of time here. And we're going to turn a motion. We're going to, there's no other public comments. We're going to bring it back. Let, let's enter a motion. Um, Mayor Rubio? I'll bring the introduction that I spoke to you before. And then, then we can open up for a further discussion once we get a motion on the table. Um, so the motion would be uh, option three modified, but uh, moving. Well, the 10% for services, 10% rental, uh, assistance, capital improvement, 65, homeless youth, 10, and administration, 5. Yeah, second. The motion second. Okay, now let's, let's open up for discussion. Um, how about right down to the one? Can you say that again? Okay, clarify that, please. Just go down to the services, 10, okay. rental assistance, 10, <coughs> capital improvement, 65, homeless youth, 10, administration, 5. Correct. I just wanted to break down that that two million dollars. Okay. So that means for services it's one point two, uh, one million two hundred and fifty thousand five hundred and twenty-five. 
Same with rental business and subsidies. Capital improvement is $8,128,000 to continue. Uh, set aside would be $1.25. Uh, admin would be $6.25. When you can just use the user data to talk to the modification. To accommodate San Diego County, all the rest of the other things that have to come through the RFP process. Yeah, because if, if San Diego County is services, that's 1.8 already, right? Correct. So, so if you're talking about 10%, 1.2, that's not 1.2, it's not even going to equal what's happening to the request. Yeah. So we need 1.8 and then whatever percentage on top of that, that we envision for services for San Diego County. I haven't spoken to you, but I, I would just say, if we're going to be successful with infrastructure, it does require people to be able to do those outreach teams out on the street, help them get into the shelter or into housing. And then once they're in the shelter or housing, how do you get people employed so then they can be able to sustain? How they, if you get into a, a unit, how do they stay housed and not return to homelessness? These are just questions that we've got to be smart and strategic on as we de decide these kind of numbers as well. What's realistic in terms of being able to um, get the people who are going to help folks uh, stay housed? Um, let's go. Let's go around. Let's go, Elliot. Just a try to keep your comments to be <laughs> Well, that's the friendly amendment makers acceptable to that, right? I don't need a second yet. But maybe you separate out San Benito and talk about these percentages right now. Okay, okay. there you go. Yeah, so yeah, I think what you need to do is that you need to draw a, con a consensus <coughs> around the Monterey County fees. Correct. And then, we, then whatever the application percentages are, it's the Monterey County piece we're overlaid by San Benito. Mm -hmm. and and so then we don't have to sit here and like work out math in front of us. We just decide what the Monterey County piece is. Okay, I think a percentage number will work if we're just talking about, we'll do the, we can do the math later. We can do the 1.8 for San Benito, and these percentages now we're talking about just this, this, the Monterey County. Correct, correct. Right. 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 Okay? Yeah. Now we're good. Okay, so we saw that proposal on the table. Uh, Robin. In my opinion, that's too much for capital improvements only because I think things usually take longer and cost more than we think. Um, and I think we heard that rental assistance subsidies can be difficult because there aren't enough people that will take Section 8 vouchers or units aren't up to code. Um, and that we need services, not just for services sake, but also to support so the new capital project that provides housing. So I would do a, a, a different split, not putting more than 40% in capital, um, just so that all our eggs aren't in one basket for this uh, this large amount of money. I'm worried too about not being able to spend it on time. Okay, let's hear from other board members. Um, Mayor Ketcher has not spoken. I, I'm not highly concerned about the money for capital improvements because I realize we have a Veterans Transition Center that could use $2 million today to start the project. <coughs> right. We're going to use a portion of that on the peninsula. They just don't know where we're going to put it yet. We're going to sneak that in the night. And we don't know how much this is going to cost. It may not. If we use sprung housing, by the way, which can be built in 45 days, for the non-builder folks. They've already been out to look at the site 45 days from the day we get the money till they're ready up and running. So it's not like we're gonna lose the money. We will spend it. So I I think this, the numbers aren't as bad as they look if we make sure San Benito's covered. And then we because some of this money isn't all going to slings, it's gonna to go to other areas. And you know we got Matt sitting here, we're not letting him off the hook. He has access and knowledge about building <coughs> He's well aware of the organization he's with. But when the Southern money comes in, he's going to help guide us in the right direction, I hope. So I'm counting on it. So. Don't make a say that today. You guys know his stuff. Quick comments. Uh, we could try to drive this up. Mary Lerner. And I would just say that some of the capital would be used to convert those non HUD uh, units that are out there right now that we can't use. That would be a house. Uh, but then we will switch it over when we need to, when we see where we're at on those emergency uh, change orders, or change orders, to adjust that. So we have the flexibility to make sure every dollar is spent and that we're getting the beds and the ground that we need. Okay. Other opinions, quickly. See none. There's, um, there's a motion for uh, what we just read earlier, 65 for capital improvement. 10 services, 10 rental assistance, 10 homeless youth, 5 admin for Monterey County, uh, removing um, San Benito County uh, on its own. Uh, everybody, all those in favor? Aye. 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 
Ben seconded. Uh, Mayor Rubio second, the Mayor Thank you. Those against? One against? Two against? Uh, three. Uh, okay. I will say six. One abstention? Robin? Three no's? So Manny was a no. Manny, Dana, and Dana. Kurt? And Kurt. Okay. And Kurt. Rest? Yes. Uh, and I'm just to. Yes. Just, I, I was comfortable with like a 60 um, capital, uh, 15 services, but this could be adjusted when we come back in January. If we think we need to make some minor adjustments, we can do that. But let's These are non binding These are non binding So we got something to work with now. Um, so, okay. So, the motion carries. Congratulations. All right. Okay. This, do we have enough to submit the ground report? We have enough to submit the ground report. By, by December, what do you have? December 15th, we'll have it in. Yeah. Okay, everyone, let's clarify that with this, we have enough to submit a proposal to heat. Which the goal is to get it in no later than December 15th, but it'd probably be earlier than that. So we don't need a meeting in December. We'll meet in January again, but that will be needed. Uh, if there's no other announcements, we're good? January 23rd is the next meeting. But not the location. Okay, you need a Thank you everyone. Right before 15 minutes.